Hey everyone, I came across a super cool blog post this weekend, Ranking YC Companies with a Neural Net by Eric Jang. This blog post describes the training of YC Rank, a model that ranks Y Combinator startups, taking as input the text descriptions of each startup based on Eric's judgment of how difficult these startups are to execute on and deliver on the mission that the startups are aiming to achieve. So say it's some super ambitious biotechnology project compared to some kind of uh, you know, NFT, pro this kind of idea with ranking, say, the deep tech of which which kinds of things are more difficult to uh, deliver on, and maybe it would help to kind of jump down to the bottom and see the rank list a little bit. Uh, you see you have Posh, Phase Biolabs, Carbon Crusher, Origami Therapeutics. This is the rank list that ends up being produced as a result of this project. So this project has jumped out to me. At the, the uniqueness of the data set I thought was so interesting to see this. So this really inspired me to kind of take a data set like this and put it into Weavia and see what kinds of things we can do with semantic search using Weaviate. So uh, I'll maybe make a video on exactly how I did this, how exactly how I got this data into Weaviate, if that kind of thing is something that people want. I've made a previous video on uploading Keras code examples into Weaviate, and uh, generally there are quite a few resources on how to import data sets into Weaviate. But anyways, just leave a comment if you want a fuller video on how to do this. But So what I have here is I have this uh, YC startup object, and it has uh, just the name and the text for now. So say Airbnb text founded in August of 2008 and based in San Francisco, California, Airbnb is a and so you have this for all these different companies and this is just me um, I, don't, I don't have the same data set that Eric has I just you know went to Y Combinator and just did some copying and pasting manually just to get something running so you see how you can do this semantic search where uh, you can insert any kind of query so say you do travel and here you see the first result is Airbnb another example could be say uh, cryptocurrency and then uh, when you search for cryptocurrency, you see how you get Coinbase at the top compared to Airbnb. And I think just kind of to make one more note about semantic search, you see how the word cryptocurrency isn't actually included in this description. It has, I mean, it has digital currency wallet, it has Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, these kinds of things, but it doesn't actually have cryptocurrency. And that's kind of a part of, say, looking at this semantic vector search compared to traditional symbolic searches. It doesn't need to have the keyword in the search result to still have this fuzzy semantic matching and that's just w one part of this general technology that I think is so interesting. So maybe one other thing that I thought was kind of cool is searching uh, digital file storage and I was because I was trying to get Dropbox to bubble up to the top but I thought it was interesting to see Coinbase was still at the top and then Dropbox and then GitLab and so I I think just the way that it was uh, ranking and this this is only a set of five companies that I put in here for now but I I just thought seeing this little ranking was just so interesting again the the ability with these with the VV8 vector search engine to take these components off the shelf to have these pre-trained say this is a hugging face mini LM sentence burn model that's encoding the vectors and the ability to just kind of take these off the shelf and already get semantic search right off of the shelf I think is so interesting you know you also have the option to say add a question answering model and these are the kinds of tasks for this uh, like zero shot transfer learning to some new data domain so this is uh, about you know using Weaviate and showing how you can do this kind of semantic search as, as one thing you can do but really what I want to get back into Eric's article are the details behind the ranking and so it's not it's um you know like adding an additional layer to just embedding similarity and say cosine similarity or you know dot product between the vectors having this kind of ranking and training ranking models is something that I really want to also dive into with this article so what you just saw in Weaviate was producing a ranked list based on vector embedding cosine similarity to the vector embedding of the query you have a vector embedding for say digital file storage and you have vector embeddings for the text descriptions of all those companies and then whichever one has the smallest cosine similarity or cosine distance is at the top largest is at the bottom so that's different from say ranking and in ranking as shown in this um, in the sketch you have the two embeddings that you take as input so say you take two vector embeddings as inputs and then you could have say separate MLP heads attention heads all sorts of ways to design these our architectures when you really dive into the details of uh, say different styles of ranking architectures but say you have two different attention heads and then say you have some kind of feature fusion maybe this is just goes into a dense layer to fuse the two intermediate representations of each thing but and then you produce say a scoring of which say one means that a is harder to execute on and b me and zero means that b is harder to execute on as the the general data labeling uh, task as highlighted right here is uh, to make the model easier to debug i base my ranking towards what was harder to execute on so the annotation the supervised learning is uh, you know you take in a and b as input the uh, the embeddings the vector embeddings and then it passes it through the ranking layer and then the ranking layer predicts 
A or B, which one is harder to build as a company or as a startup, as a technical uh, challenge. So this blog post is super interesting, uh, describing a lot of details, and I highly recommend uh, just reading this through this for yourself. But to give you a quick helicopter tour, uh, you see the overview of the problem statement. You know, imagine trying to distill the complexity of making these judgments and sorting this list of uh, startups into some kind of um, you know, some kind of automation system. Uh, this is a look at the data set. You see interesting details about Y Combinator startups, like the long description, the location, uh, team size, tags, um, the batch of Y Combinator, say, are they hiring? Interesting stuff. So so overall, it's a very interesting uh, list that describes these companies. You see the final, I think this is the, uh, the final cleaned up data from the initial data and what's used for modeling. Uh, then describing how the data is labeled, uh, describing having this very interesting semi-supervised sorting problem. So, uh, so Eric's not going to uh, sort all 393 because the combinatorics of that for every single pairwise ranking, I think, would be very difficult. So what instead you do is you label a subset of it, and then you see how it can propagate these labels forward in the semi-supervised learning sense. So uh, doing this train test split, the test set, you use it right there to label the rest of the data set. And I think generally this is interesting with respect to these ideas like out of distribution generalization because uh, you know it's still the test set is still in the same data distribution as the training set, and it is useful to make predictions on the same distribution. So this kind of reminds me of, say, using autoencoders to compress data sets and things like maybe the coin algorithm, these ideas where uh, you don't really need to generalize out of distribution for the predictive tasks to be useful. So returning back to the focus of the project, the two different uh, Y Combinator startups are then passed into this ranking architecture where you have the two descriptions of each startup, then they have separate uh, parametric encoding heads, and then the features are combined in some way. And then you have the rank loss based on the annotations of which startup is harder to execute on, A or B. The model is a modified Roberta classification head. Roberta is one of the most popular extensions to BERT, and it's built on top of I think pre-trained Roberta embeddings. Uh, because the number of training examples was fairly small, I got a decent boost, plus 10% accuracy, tuning hyperparameters, and, and employing a variety of regularization tricks. So this is a very interesting uh, kind of nugget of this as well as seeing that uh, because you have a small data set, it's important to be looking at regularization. Uh, I've looked into things like text data augmentation a little bit, and I think this general s scope of things, uh, recently I've made videos about Mosaic ML's Composer, and Composer has all sorts of regularization tricks. So if you want to go see what a variety of regularization tricks looks like for yourself, I highly recommend checking out Mosaic ML Composer and going to their website and seeing methods like ghost batch normalization, stochastic path dropout, Anyways, that whole kind of set of things. So then we look at data labeling with active learning. And this is one of the most interesting trends in deep learning is this general thing of semi-supervised learning. And I think what Eric's onto with this embedding space uh, kind of like weak labeling compared to the ranking layers kind of hard prediction, I think this kind of interplay is very interesting. This reminds me of an old paper that I've read uh, called Co-Match from I think Salesforce Research, where they're uh, doing research in semi-supervised contrastive learning, and they also had this kind of difference between logit layer loss functions and intermediate vector space layer loss functions. And the way that this is being used in active learning to see which points to label, because uh, you get the the embedding space will suggest to Eric points that it thinks are similar. And then Eric can relabel these points for the sake of the supervised ranking layer. So say at layer six, you have these vector embeddings and then say, you know, once you add these two, uh, these two layers at layer eight, you eventually produce the rank loss. So imagine this NLP embedding is, a, is an abstracted six layers of deep learning computation. Then you produce this vector, then say layer seven, layer eight, you get the ranking loss but you can use this embedding layer to propose nearby uh, points. So it's not you know, not just A, B, as you go through this list of 393 companies, most of, most of which the pairwise are you know, unlabeled as you do the, you know, I think it's like 393 choose two, that kind of computation maybe for, that, that might be wrong, but the combinatorics of how many pairs of two there are in this data set. So following the description of data labeling with active learning and using the embedding space to propose uh, candidates for uh, additional human in the loop labeling, which I thought was super interesting, uh, we finally end up with the ranked list from White Lab Genomics uh, un unleashing the potential of DNA and RNA based therapies using AI. The description, we've developed an AI platform enabling to accelerate the discovery and the design of genomic therapies such as cell therapies, RNA therapies, and DNA therapies team size 13. So uh, I think this is an example for the active labeling. This was an example where in the embedding space, uh, here was the nearest neighbor and then Eric, uh, you know, re-ranked it based or uh, added the labeling of these two A and B 
white lab genomics and tool chest. Uh, so very interesting uh, takeaway at the end. After two iterations, a total of an additional 30 labels boost the test accuracy from 81% to 91%. So that's huge. 30 labels boosted at 10% and 91% seems like a pretty good score to me. So uh, then in results, you see the final uh, result of ranking these uh, different companies and I'm not exactly sure the details of this but I highly recommend checking out this article uh, and the article concludes with uh, some different uh, de some takeaways from the experiments with the rank list uh, some opportunities for how to extend this with future work and then some uh, debugging tips that uh, made the training of this model work out so uh, to kind of conclude this I, I thought this was just so interesting please check out this article ranking YC companies with a neural net by Eric Jang it's linked in the description of this video and this was just such a fun project for me uh, putting it into Weavia was also a lot of fun and very interesting application. I've been super excited about deep learning for natural language processing. In my view, we have seen more than enough evidence of the readiness of this technology with things just say like the GPT-3 demos and say Codex and seeing what these things have been able to do. I think it's now more about the data sets and the problems that these models are being models and algorithms are being pointed at. Eric's article really stood out to me because of its uniqueness and I wanted to make a quick point at the end of this video about data-centric AI. Academic NLP is mostly about studying, say, Wikipedia-based data sets with a good deal of, say, news articles, and uh, increasingly we've seen scientific paper data sets like biomedical or computer science papers. So Eric's use of, in YC rank, the use of company descriptions, this really stood out to me again as uh, unique and interesting. So I think this opportunity to, say, explore maybe economic objects that can be described with text, there's, say, the Crunchbase API for getting this kind of company descriptions, um, microacquire listings is an interesting platform, maybe, say, like, Upwork job postings and freelancer descriptions, um, AngelList maybe, real estate listings. There's like a, f a few websites you can think of if you just kind of like try to think of where you can get text descriptions of like economic things like, or you know, find I don't know what category you'd really classify this as because I don't have that kind of formal background. But in conclusion, I'm absolutely thrilled to see this example of NLP and venture capital. I can't wait to see where Eric takes this uh, YC rank project and it was so interesting to see this. Uh, I also wanted to make a quick note of some things out there that also facilitate uh, data set sharing and the discovery of unique data sets. So some of these things include hugging face data sets and spaces, papers with codes, papers with data, Kaggle, and generally any open source deep learning effort that uh, presents the novel data sets and you know, makes their examples and uh, results reproducible by publishing the data sets and just generally kind of, even if you don't have the data set file itself, just kind of pointing in the direction of a new application, I think is enough for kind of a sizable contribution in this space of data centric AI and discovering new applications for uh, for deep learning. So I want to quickly point also again back to this trend of data centric AI. I think this term is mostly being pushed by, um, I think, Andrew Ang, and I've seen say snorkel AI on social media making exciting developments and using this kind of language of data centric AI to really focus on like the data part of AI and not just the algorithms, which I think, you know, kind of coming back to the first point of this, I think kind of the algorithms and models are like clearly work. And so I think it's about putting it on the right problem, so to say. And I think it'll also help you discover the problems with the model. So with all that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please check out Semi Technologies on YouTube to see more content related to the Weaviate Vector Search Engine and interviews with interesting people working on deep learning and deep learning for search. Mm -hmm.